thanks for coming in for the, or virtually to the Leroy Collins Leon County Library's Family History Webinar. My name is Nellie Beers Barron. I'm a librarian at the Dr. B. L. Perry Jr. Branch. And I am Shauna. I am a librarian at the uh, Leroy Collins Main Branch. Okay, yeah, and we're thrilled to introduce Josh Goodman, an archives historian who works at, on the Florida Memory Project at the State Archives of Florida. Josh will be taking us through how to use publicly available resources to trace ownership of land back through history. It's a fascinating to topic, and I am definitely ready to learn a lot over the next hour. If you have questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A, and Josh has got some pauses throughout uh, as sections end to be able to um, answer some of those questions. And as a heads up, we'll be recording this session to possibly include it on the county's, uh, the county library's social media accounts. And after the talk, we'll have a few announcements. So from here, um, I'll let Josh uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Nellie. Thank you, Shauna, for uh, having me today for this program on using land documents in tracing family history. It is a uh, it's an interesting sort of addition to your genealogical research toolbox. A lot of folks are, uh, you know, get started looking through the census, looking through marriage records and death records and things like that uh, to start building up their family tree. But uh, once you've kind of got the basics down, you know, mom, dad, and the kids, and birth dates and death dates and marriage dates, then the next thing that a lot of folks like to do is start filling out, well, what do these people do, uh, you know, my ancestors, while they're actually alive? And one of the most important things you can do, and one of the most interesting things you can do, is determine where exactly these people lived. Now imagine being able to go out there to some place in Florida or in any other state really, and to be able to determine exactly, to stand on the same ground where an ancestor of yours, whose blood runs through your veins, lived 100 years ago, 150 years ago, maybe even 200 years ago. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that today. It's easier than you think, and the resources for doing that research are, by and large, available online. A good bit of it is, uh, you know, a, a good bit of uh, the private land transactions are not quite available online just yet, but a lot of the oldest transactions, ironically, are the ones that have been made available online. So we're going to look at a combination of all those today. Um, just uh, a couple of things to think about as we move forward. I'm going to introduce a little bit about the State Archives uh, here in just a bit. Now, we're going to use Florida examples and mostly Leon County examples in today's program. Uh, but a lot of what we talk about today is going to be applicable to other states. So if you're working with family lines that are not just running in Florida, as I know a lot of us have family in Alabama and Georgia and the Carolinas, once you go back a you know, a, a hundred years or so. Uh, don't worry, you can still use a lot of these same tips and tricks for land that's in other states. Now, the first thing I need to do is go ahead and share my screen. The, uh, Nelly, would you make it so that I can share my screen, please? You're muted. You're good to go. All right. Okay, I'm going to share this screen, and then if you guys will let me know, confirm that you're able to see my PowerPoint here that says using land documents and family history research. Awesome, very good. All right, and we're off and running. Just to say a few things, first of all, about kind of where I work uh, and, and what we do at the State Archives. Uh, the State Archives of Florida is located in the R.A. Gray Building, two blocks behind the Capitol on Bruno Street. Uh, we have, we are the, the official repository for Florida's state government records, all three branches of government, executive, judicial, and legislative, all deposit records with us, and so do a number of private donors, private businesses, families, individuals, organizations, and through a combination of those government records and those private records, correspondence, diaries, photographs, films, we're able to facilitate all kinds of historical research on uh, Florida and its many communities and families and, and people. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of wonderful material here. Family history is a big part of why people come to visit us. Out of the 50,000 cubic feet of records that we have, a nice portion of those records do have a lot of insight 
in, in ways that you might not think about. Uh, there's, there actually is a lot to do beyond just ancestry and family search and things like that. We love those resources, but when you're ready to take it to the next level or when you sort of hit a brick wall, with the research that you're doing. Sometimes you have to get a little creative about the records that you're using. You might need to get into some more obscure types of records, things like tax rolls and homestead applications and business licensure records and that sort of thing, articles of incorporation, stuff that you won't always find on the big websites online. So um, a lot of people think that the state archives is only for government employees to use or only for the legislature to use or or maybe you have to have special permission to come in or something like that. And that's not the case at all. As you can see here, this is our public reading room. It's very similar to most other public libraries you've walked into. Uh, we have both the state library and the state archives in the same building. We share a reading room. The library focuses on published materials dealing with Florida. The archives focuses on the unpublished materials, letters, diaries, photographs, things like that. Uh, so uh, you can now, of course, right now we have some restrictions in place because of COVID. However, if you pay attention to our website at info.florida.gov, that's info.florida.gov, you can get the latest information about when we're opening and the safety measures that we'll be putting into place to make sure that you're safe and have an excellent experience when you come to pay us a visit. But let's go ahead and jump right into what we're talking about today, which is using land records in genealogy. This is, this is my goal for what I'd like for us to get done today in the next hour here, is to look at the kinds of land documents that are available. What can you actually expect to find in Florida and generally in other states as well, how to access those land documents. There are a lot of databases out there that offer access to these documents, but the databases were not necessarily intended for genealogists. Many of them were intended rather for land surveyors and property appraisers and people who do uh, a little bit more technical work with the, the history of chain of title for pieces of land. And so they weren't necessarily designed um, with the everyday person in mind. We can, uh, by just using a few little tips and tricks though, I can sort of uh, make these databases a little easier to use and give you some shortcuts to keep you from having to do a whole lot of learning once you get onto those databases. Uh, also, once we access those land documents, they use a system that we still use today. We've been using it since the 1820s. So for 200 years, we've been measuring land in Florida using the same system, the public land survey system, which divides all of our state up into a series of townships. And then each township is divided up into sections. And then each section is divided up into smaller, what we call aliquot parts. I will explain what all of those mean so that you'll know what you're looking at when you see the gobbledygook on your great, great, great grandfather's deed or land patent from the federal government. You will be able to determine exactly where in real space a piece of property is located. And there's great online tools to help you do that. So we're gonna look at that too. Uh, and then of course, the, if, if from all of that, you should be able to determine where an ancestor owned property or maybe you would like to look and see who lived right where you live today here in Florida. We should be able to get all of this done uh, in this hour here. Now, if you have questions that pop up during the course of the program, we have a, if you look on the little bar there, uh, you've got a Q&A. It's got two little voice bubbles and it says Q&A. It's right next to participants. And if you'll click on that, it gives you the opportunity to ask a question. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a few stopping points uh, as we go through the program. And uh, that way we don't get too many questions built up and you know, folks might need to leave right at the end or something. And I'll try to, uh, I'll try to get some of those questions answered if you've got one that's going to be, uh, we might combine some questions together. Um, and, and so uh, we'll, we'll just take them as we get them and, and try to get all your questions answered. And of course, you'll have my contact information at the end. If you've got big problems you need to share, everybody always has a stumper. Uh, by the time you learn about some of these resources, I'm glad to help you with those. You can always email me after this is over. So off and running. There are four main ways to acquire land that your ancestors acquired land. And we're included in this list as well. 
of ways that you can acquire land. And why this is important is because the way you acquire land governs what kind of documentation there will be of that transfer of title. Um, the most common way to acquire land these days is actually the third bullet on the list, and that is private sales. That's when one private individual or a company or a developer or any sort of private entity that is not the government sells a piece of land to another private entity, any kind of private entity. All right, those private sales, um, you know, once, uh, once land, when land is given out from the government the first time to a private individual, in other words, it goes from what we call the sovereign. Uh, it goes from um, a public entity, a public government entity to a private individual. That kind of a deed we generally call a patent because just like the letters patent that create a new duke or new earl or new whatever over in, you know, over in a monarchical uh, country, uh, you're creating something anew sort of in, in the parlance of, of land titles. So uh, when the federal or state government gives out new land, or not new land rather, but rather they give title to a piece of land uh, for the first time into the private sector, we call that a patent. But anytime it goes through a private sale, we call it a deed. And those, uh, those deeds that transfer from one person to another, they're typically uh, recorded in a different way than patents. And so we're going to start out with uh, some of the very earliest kinds of land records that you can access uh, for folks who acquired land after Florida was obtained by the United States in 1821. And those are going to be federal land patents and then state land patents. The last kind of land acquisition that I have here on the list is a tax sale. Um, you see it every year. You look in the newspaper if you're in a smaller community where they can do that, or, or maybe the tax collector has a list on their uh, website, or you see all these folks who haven't paid their taxes yet for their land, or maybe they didn't pay enough taxes or something like that. Um, Florida law provides that if somebody doesn't pay their taxes on their land for a certain amount of time, that land can be put up for public auction. Now, even though it's a public entity who manages that public auction, uh, the documentation of a tax sale looks very similar to a private sale. It's still a deed. We call it a tax deed instead of just a, a normal warranty deed or whatever. But, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a very similar thing. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the federal land patents. I like these the most because they are the oldest. And if you run across one of these for one of your relatives, it's always a big moment because you're almost guaranteed if, if you're running across one of these for one of your relatives that it's going to be at least 120, 150 years old. That's pretty cool. So let's look at federal land patents. Here we go. So this is an example of a federal land patent. They don't all look exactly like this. They follow this general form most of the time. Um, they're usually, let me go ahead and get my pen going here. I love the pen. All right, here we go. So they're usually going to have a nice little certificate number here. It's going to give you the name of the person who's receiving the land. All right. It's going to tell you where, which land office, which government land office this person purchased the land from. Okay. Florida had general land offices at Tallahassee, Noonansville, which is kind of in the Gainesville area. Um, there have been a couple others. I think there was one at Tampa at one point, but Tallahassee and Noonansville are the main ones that you're going to encounter for land patents in our area in North Florida and Central Florida. All right, but most importantly on a land patent, in addition to the name of the person buying it and the place where they actually did the transaction, you're going to get a legal description of where exactly that land was located in real space. All right, in this particular case, we're looking at a land patent where a piece of land was purchased by a guy named Shadrick Atkinson of Florida. He purchased it at the register, uh, from the Register of the Land Office at Tallahassee, and said Atkinson, according to the provisions of the Act of Congress of the 24th of April, 1820, saying an act for further provision, further provision for the sale of public lands, which that essentially said $1.25 an acre, Somebody comes into the office and says they want some land. That's all they got to pay. And it says uh, that the piece of land that Shadrick Atkinson has purchased here is the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter of section 27 
in Township 3 North of Range 3 East in the District of Land subject to sale at Tallahassee, Florida, containing 40 acres. All right, now that sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook, but we're gonna, by the end of today, you should be able to locate this on a map. In fact, we're gonna return back to a federal land patent just like this, and I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how to find exactly where that's talking about, okay? Now, the other stuff that's cool on this, this one that you're looking at on the screen, this is an original. This is the copy that would have actually been given to Shadrick Atkinson so that he would have proof of title, uh, that, you know, to show that he had actually purchased this land. He would have taken this to the county courthouse probably to get it recorded by the clerk of courts at that time. We know it's an original though because it's got this nice embossed seal uh, from the government land office. And notice that the, uh, the, the, the patent is signed in the name of the president. In this case, it's Martin Van Buren who was president at the time that this transaction went down, which is, we can see down here, the ninth day of February, 18 and 41, okay? And uh, it's actually signed here. Now, uh, I hate to say it, if you've got one of these and you're thinking, wow, I've got the, a signature from the president of the United States, I hate to break it to you, it's usually a secretary from the government land office who's signing off on these, or else it would be a, a very, uh, a very, very busy president who would have time to do very little else besides sign land patents. So I hate to bust your bubble on that one, but, but these typically are secretary signatures. Um, still though, they're pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's a document signed by the president of the United States that has to do with your family. Okay, so all this great information showing that an individual has purchased land directly from the federal government. What this document represents is when somebody comes to Florida, it's the 1820s, it's the 30s, the 40s, or something like that, they're a brand new settler, and there's no private land maybe in, in that county or in that place where they want to settle. There's nowhere for them, there's no private individuals who own any land that's up for sale. The reason for that is because prior to a private individual owning a piece of land, title to that piece of land rests with the federal government or the state government. And so, um, in most cases, when people first settled in Florida, they weren't actually buying land from other people. They were buying land directly from the federal government or getting it in auctions or establishing a homestead. And then if they met the qualifications, they would receive title to the land from the federal government. No matter which one of those they were doing, whether it was an auction, a cash sale, or a homestead, all three types of home, or all three types of property acquisition result in this same kind of document, a federal land patent. So, Let's say that you have an ancestor who arrived in Florida in the 1830s, 1840s or something, and you suspect that they might have acquired land via a federal land patent. How would you find it? Well, let's talk about how to do that. You're in luck. The Bureau of Land Management, which is a subdivision of the Department of the Interior, the United States Department of the Interior, they actually have a wonderful database online that has all kinds of records relating to these general land office sales, whether it be homesteads or, sale or, or cash sales or options. And this is the website. So we're going to actually go to that website and we're going to show you how to actually get to uh, these records. Uh, and I should mention that these are, because this is a federal database, there's a lot more to it than just, uh, than just Florida. Any state or territory uh, where federal land was patented out. So that means pretty much anybody except the 13 original colonies, uh, you're going to be able to get records on that land acquisition for that. So I'm going to start a new share here, and I'm going to go to my Google. So you should now be seeing a great big thing that says Zoom, right? Nelly, we're seeing Zoom? Okay, good. All right, so we're going to go to that website. And that website is glorecords.blm.gov. All right, and here we go. Um, it takes you to the U.S. Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management, and you've got a wonderful menu here of tools that you can use to research the history of land ownership in your area. But if you're looking for land that was purchased by a specific individual, um, the best place to start is with land patents. All right, 
And this is going to take you to a very confusing uh, control panel, but it's easier than it looks. A key tip, a pro tip on this, all right? You got lots of things that you can put in here. And you may be very, very excited because you know lots and lots of stuff about where your ancestor's piece of land should be. My advice to you, put in as little information into this search engine as you absolutely can. Here's why. This is not as forgiving as Google. If you put in a first name that is spelled just one letter off from the way the name was spelled on the land patent, won't work. Maybe your ancestor used his or her initials instead of their first name when the patent was being filled out. If you put in their first name instead of their initials and they use their initials on the document, won't work. All right. Uh, same thing with counties. Florida's county boundaries have changed dramatically over the years. I mean, we started with just two counties in 1822. So for that reason, or in 1821 actually, uh, for that reason, unless you're really just getting tons and tons and tons and tons of records and you need a way to narrow things down, I wouldn't even put the county in when you're trying to look for a particular individual. Okay, so let's pretend, let's, let's use my Atkinson reference. Let's pretend that I knew of, um, that, that, that Shadrach Atkinson was an ancestor of mine. And I know that he owned land somewhere in the vicinity of Leon County. I don't know exactly where. I've been told that it was in Leon County, but it might have been Jefferson, could have been Gadsden. He just, I know he spent some time in Leon County at some point in his life. And I know that his name was Shadrack Atkinson. Okay, here's how I would go about doing that search. First of all, I think it's pretty safe to say we need to just look in Florida, if, if that's the question. Now, both the names Shadrach and Atkinson have a number of different spellings in their names. For example, you might have noticed on the, uh, on the patent that we were looking at that Shadrach was actually spelled with CK at the end. Now, the spelling that you typically see in the biblical version of that name and in a lot of versions you know, used in more modern times, you actually end that with a CH instead of a CK. So that's another place where you might be tempted to go ahead and put everything you know about this person into the search. I wouldn't do that. I would start off with, looks like I've been looking this one up before. I would start off with just the last name, okay? Now, you've got lots of other options in here. You really don't have to put any of that in there. The only time that I would, I would go any farther than just the state and the last name and maybe the county is if you need to narrow things down because you're getting so many results. A name like Williams or Smith or Johnson or Brown, yes, put some other delineators in there. But this is going to be enough right now that we can probably find old Shadrach just like this. So I've got Florida and Atkinson in here. This is going to give me back every federal land patent for every guy named Atkinson who ever received land from the federal government. And here's my results list. It's four pages long, which that's actually not that bad. You type in, you do the same thing with Smith or Williams, prepare for your computer to smoke because it's a lot. All right. So here we go. We've got all these names. We've got dates. And what's lovely about this is that we can actually sort these results however we want to. All right. So for example, right now, see the little arrow? It's actually right now the, the results list is sorted by name. So I can actually follow this until I get to the Atkinson comma S's and I can determine uh, if, uh, if, you know, if, um, uh, if Shadrach is in there. So let's do that. Let's, I bet you he's going to be, oh, woo, man, he was busy. Look at that. Look at all that land from Shadrach. Okay. Now let's say, for example, that I wanted to find his land, the patent for his land that was located in a particular place. So for example, um, let's see, I can't, I don't know if you guys will be able to see this, but I'm actually looking right now back at his um, patent and it's in the Southwest quarter of the Southwest quarter section 27 in township three North, three East. So three North, three East section 27. All right, I can actually go, everybody can still see my search results, right? We're still seeing search results, good, okay. So what I can actually do at this point is I could actually go in and search by township here and say, all right, I just want to see all the people who, you know, all the people who own land in these particular townships. I can go around until I find 
the one that I want, three north, three east. And I said he was in section 27. I may have read that wrong because it looks like he doesn't have any in section 27 right here. But I can find, what I can do here is I can find the land that Shadrach Atkinson had and a, oh, I see what it is, yeah. Um, I can find the land that he had in a particular township in this way. Now I'll show you another kind of search that you can do. Let's say that I wanted to know who Shadrach's neighbors were, okay? Let me go back to my search, uh, to my search box right here. And let's say that I wanted to know who Shadrach's neighbors were. And I know that he had property in Township 3 North, 3 East, Section 27. All right. Um, let's see. What I could do here is I wouldn't put in any names because I don't know who the neighbors are yet. So I'm not going to put any names there. But let's say that I wanted to find out everybody who lived in 3 North, 3 East, section number 27. Okay, I can run a search for patents here. And there's Shadrach, there's his piece in 3 North, 3 East, section 27. But look, I get to see everybody else who was the original settlers of land in that same place. These are his neighbors. He would have known these people. Shadrach gets his land in 1841. All these guys would have already been living there or would have only already owned property there. So Shadrach is actually the newcomer in this neighborhood, if you see this. So you can use this to these land records to determine just all kinds of things. So now I haven't actually shown you how to get into the, the, the picture of the patent itself. You get more than just this wonderful data. I love the table data because you can use it to compare and contrast between different people. But if you're really just dying to get to that wonderful um, certificate, you can just click on the image file over here, the yellow document looking thing, and it'll go straight to a PDF of the uh, certificate signed by the president, well, signed by the president, it's actually his secretary, but, uh, but anyway, it, it's, uh, you'll get all of that same information that we saw in the book. Now you'll see this is, you'll notice that this is shaped on, this is on slightly different shaped paper than what we had on the other one. And that's because this is a file copy. So they would have put this into a bound volume of these certificates. You can see the page number right here. So that's how you get your hands on a land patent. Get in here and play with this. Again, there's really no way to break it. It's just, you know, like I say, you're going to cheat yourself out of good search results if you get too specific. So I would say start with just the state slash territory uh, or, or la and last name. I wouldn't start putting in townships and ranges and sections. I wouldn't even put in middle names if there's even any possibility that the person, you know, that the, the name uh, might be misspelled or it might be spelled differently in those days. If you do choose to go that route, if you're dealing with some Williamses or Smiths or something, uh, then just be prepared to try several different spellings of the name because again, this is not Google. It's not going to try and guess based on what you put in. It's very claptrap. All right, so let's jump back into the PowerPoint for our next, for our next uh, kind of record. All right, state land patents. So I mentioned that when settlers first come into Florida, one of the most common ways they get land is they get land from the federal government because there's not a lot of people in the early days who actually have privately acquired land title, uh, title to land in Florida, certainly not in our part of Florida. It's a little different when you get over around Pensacola and St. Augustine because those were big populated areas during the Spanish colonial era. But around where we are, it's mostly going to be federal and state land patents to start out with. Now, the state could give out land just the same as the federal government. But the question you may be asking is, well, how did the state get it? So, you know, this is this is a big topic right now, uh, you know, as we're as we're dealing with with COVID and the, the fallout from that is there's been a lot of of uh, questions about funding and, and how governments sort of, how the federal government assists states and local governments in doing what they need to do to respond uh, to the crisis. Well, um, the federal government actually did something very similar in helping the state or the territory, Florida was a territory before 1845, uh, helping the territory develop itself. Now, it's kind of a, it's, nobody could really conceive of the idea of the federal government giving that much cash 
uh, to a state, even no matter how many strings were, were put on it. I mean, that amount of cash just didn't really exist at that time. It just wasn't a thing. But what the federal government could do, what the federal government did have, that they could give the state to allow the state to make some money and sort of build up uh, its infrastructure was to give it title to land that the state could then turn around and sell. So the federal government regularly at different times, sometimes by request of the state, sometimes just because it came up in Congress and they passed an act and they felt like it. Uh, sometimes they would, uh, they would give away these massive grants of land to the state. Sometimes it was just swamp land that they figured, well, federal government can't do anything with this, but maybe if we give it to the state, they can partner up with some private companies that can drain that swamp, or maybe they can build a railroad across it, or they can sell it to a railroad company that'll, you know, they'll do something with it. The idea here is that the state government, it was thought, could do more with a lot of this federally owned, unpatented land than the federal government could. And so the state government actually acquired title to a tremendous amount of acreage in Florida very quickly after becoming a territory. So once the uh, state or territory had that land, uh, it had to be managed and controlled by somebody. And so the state developed an instrumentality called the Board of Trustees of the Internal Improvement Fund. And this entity still exists today. The Internal Improvement Fund is the entity that holds title to all state-owned land. In fact, most of the government agencies that you work with on a regular basis, they actually lease that land from the Internal Improvement Fund. Uh, it's kind of interesting how that all works out on paper. The, luckily, the deeds and all the leases and all that stuff, it's all online. You can get a look at it. It's pretty, it makes for pretty cool reading. Uh, at least for, for research dudes uh, like me. So um, here's how this works with, uh, with, with state land patents. The patenting process was essentially the same as it was for the federal, uh, for the federal government. Uh, if the state determined that there was a good reason that they needed to, uh, uh, you know, that it would be beneficial in the public interest for them to grant land to people, and they did, uh, then they would grant land to people through a patenting program the same way as the federal government. The state of Florida did this to attract immigrants. Uh, and by that, I, I mean not only folks from abroad, but also people from other parts of the United States. They did this to attract railroad companies. They did this to attract businesses of other sorts. Um, they also did this um, to uh, raise money for education. Uh, a lot of times the state legislature would uh, grant certain pieces of land to, uh, to the, um, the um, state educational authorities, and the sales of those lands, the proceeds from those sales, would then be put directly into the coffers of the state education uh, authorities. And so they would be able to, to assist with, with building schools and things like that. Now, because these, uh, because these land patents were done by the state and not by the federal government, they are produced by different document creators and they are kept in a different database. So where do you find these? Well, let's go look. All right, this is the long convoluted URL uh, for where that is. And I'm glad we're recording this because you're going to be able to, uh, uh, you're going to, be able to, to look at this later. Uh, but here's a little shortcut you can write down if you're looking for this and you don't have time to write down that gobbledygook that I just circled. You can search for Florida DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, BTLDS, which stands for, I'm not sure what it is, Board of Trustees, I think. Board of Trustees Land Document System is what it stands for. I kind of scratched my head on that one. All right, so here we go. Let's go take a look at that record. I'm going to share my browser. There we go. Uh, Sean and, and Nellie, are we, seeing, are we seeing the browser now? Excellent. Okay. So let's go, let's, let's do it. Let's pretend that I didn't write all that down uh, like I just did there. If I type in Florida DEP Board of Trustees Land Document System, yep, that's the very first thing that comes up in Google when I search for those acronyms like that. And again, the reason why these think why these databases are a little clunky is again, these are not designed for genealogists. 
They're not designed for the average public. They're designed for land surveyors and, and people who want to go online and research government ownership of land and, and stuff like that. So, so you know, they, they're, they're always glad to help if you call the Bureau of State Lands or if you call the Government Land Office, Bureau of Land Management. They're always happy to help. But this is, since we're not really their primary audience, uh, they just designed this a little differently than Ancestry.com. So what you want to do when you get on the DEP business portal here is you want to come down here to document search. Okay. And once again, just like the, uh, just like we saw with the federal land patents, there is this multi, multi confusing control panel here, 90% of which you don't need. All right. What you need is, it, what we're looking for here in this particular moment is we're looking for how do you determine if a member of your family, if an ancestor in your family tree ever got a patent for state land from the state government of Florida, or the territorial governor of Florida. All right, so these, in this little pull down menu here that says document type, these are all the different kinds of documents that this system includes. It's actually a lot more than the federal one. Okay, and you'll notice that unfortunately they have used this system of um, this system of uh, acronyms to describe what you're looking at here. And the only way you can get a sense of what they are is to mouse over them, and they'll show you what they are. I have asked them if they would mind making just a nice little list you can click on. I haven't done that quite yet, but hopefully they will sometime in the future. There's two kinds of records that we care about in this moment. If you're, if you're curious uh, whether an ancestor got a, a patent of state land from the state of Florida, there's two main kinds of documents that are going to tell you that. The most common one is going to be TFI, which is Trustees of the Internal Improvement Trust Fund Instruments. You'll oftentimes see this word kicked around in, le in deeds and mortgages and other documents, this term instrument. Okay, and that's the official term that they use for deeds that are done by the, the Board of Trustees for the Internal Improvement Fund. TFI is where the vast majority of your land documents, uh, of your, of your uh, land patents from the state come from. There is a minority of those documents that will be under BEI, which is Board of Education Instruments. Those are specifically plots of land that were sold to private individuals from the pot of land that had been reserved by the state for the proceeds to go towards helping out the school fund. All right, but the vast majority of, of state land patents for the homestead program or going out to railroads or things like that, they're gonna come from TFI. So let's select that. Now, just like it was with the federal land patents, you've got a lot of different choices about stuff to put in here. Put as little as possible as little as possible. I would do last name first just to see if you get what you want on that and then if you really need to narrow down maybe go back in and add the first name. So I'm going to look and see if I've got I'm going to look and see if I've got any uh, if I've got any relatives in here. Let me let me see what could I put in here. I put in Goodman. Let me put in Wilcox. I have some relatives named Wilcox. Let's see if any of my Wilcox ancestors received any patents of state land. So I put in document type TFI. This system will not work unless you specify document type. And then I put in a last name. So I'm saying show me every instrument from the Internal Improvement Fund that went to a dude or, or lady named Wilcox. Let's see how it goes. It's going to, the screen's going to go kind of dark here for a little bit and then it's gonna go back to being light, and then it's still gonna take another minute more to actually do its thinking, okay? If, you, if there are no results uh, that are applicable to your search terms, the, the page won't change. It'll just have a little red line of text up there at the top that says no documents match your search. But it looks like, it looks like I do have some Wilcoxes uh, for which they received uh, patents of land from the state. Okay, and these could be for all kinds of different reasons. It doesn't have to just be, um, it doesn't have to just be a homestead program or something like this. And it shows me the county that they're in. Okay, and so, and if you click on, you can actually adjust uh, this little window right here. You can actually get the date, the document number, if you've got that. Some people, they, they learn the document number through other sources and you can use that to kind of look around in here. Um, 
let's see. So there's there's just all kinds of stuff in here. Let's see if I find any from here in North Florida. Sarasota clay, Okeechobee, Indian River, Orange, Putnam. None of these are any of my Wilcoxes, but let's pretend uh, that I'm just looking for evidence of some Wilcox receiving land from the state in the 19th century. I can click on each one of these and then look uh, at the um, look at the information that's down below uh, to see let's see to see the oldest one. So this one, Merton Wilcox from Sarasota County. This document comes from 1966. That's not very old. This one's from 66. What about this one here? That one's 1879. That's pretty old. Let's look at this Elizabeth Wilcox deed from 1879, October 13th, 1879. If I want to see that, over here on the left-hand side, you'll see that it's got a number here, and it says, displays the scan document. Let's click on that and see what happens. There we go. Just like the Federal Land Document Database, here is the image for that deed. And just like the federal deed, it's going to show me the amount of, look at this, look at this. Elizabeth Wilcox received this land for 90 cents an acre. Can you imagine getting any land in Florida for 90 cents an acre at this point? My heavens, they tell you what county it was in and they give you a legal description. Again, it's using that public land survey system, those sections and townships and ranges, southwest quarter of the southeast quarter of section 39. And then there's another piece that she's got here in township eight south around range 24 east. And it gives you all the key information in here. Now, of course, instead of being signed by the secretary of the president, this time it's signed by the governor and the other members of the Internal Improvement Fund. Because remember, this land is coming from the state ownership, not the federal government. So that is how you get your hands on a state land patent. All right, I'm going to jump back into the PowerPoint and then I'm going to look real quick to see if there's any questions. I do see one question in the Q&A box. So let me get my slide shared here and then I'm going to see what the question is. What were the two first counties? Those are Escambia and St. And St. John's. Escambia and St. John's. All right, so we answered that live. Good. Okay. All right, so we're back into the PowerPoint here. And all right, so the last type, private land transactions. Now these, there's a lot of different kinds of documents that fall under this category. We'll talk about the most common ones, all right? Uh, with, uh, with, with private land transactions, this is when a private individual sells land to another private individual. Those individuals could also be companies, they could be associations, they could be groups of people, they could be anything. All right, but what they are not is a public entity, okay? Once land has been patented out from the federal or the state government, then every transaction after that is going to be, with very few exceptions, is going to be a private land transaction between private entities, all right? Now, these transactions, uh, the ones you're, you're, you're any, if any of you own, um, property, uh, own title to land, the documents that, that, you know, the deeds that you have that record that land ownership, that's essentially that kind of land document. It's the same way that land ownership has been recorded in Florida uh, as, as far as a private land transaction since the beginning of the territorial uh, era in 1821. Okay, and the deeds, mortgages, warranty deeds, quick claim deeds, any kind of deed you want to talk, tax deeds, any kind of private land transaction that you want to talk about, uh, where two private individuals are selling land one to the other, those are not going to be retained by the federal government or the state government. There might be copies retained by the state government. For example, at the state archives, we have um, microfilm copies that were done by the, the LDS church back in the 60s and 70s. We have copies of the deed records for most counties here at the state archives that you can go through. It might save you a trip to several courthouses if your research is going to take you to several different places around the state. But the main place that you go for records of private land transactions is the clerk of the courts in the county where the land transaction took place. 
Okay, let's see what I've got here in the way of, okay, so I don't actually have an example slide right here. What I've got here is a, a, an example of what some of these things look like. Deeds, once you go far enough back, they're all handwritten, which makes them really fun to look through. Uh, some of them are going to be done on nice little forms like this. Now, when it comes to accessing these, luckily, uh, funding has been made, uh, made available and, and clerks of courts have been working really hard over the last few years uh, to make more and more of these deeds going all the way back into the 1800s available online. Not every clerk of court is, is at the same level at that point. It just depends on how much funding is available, how much they're prioritizing this. They may have other things that they need to be working on. So some counties, you've got really, really great uh, resources to find everything you need online. Orange County is one of those counties, for example. They've done an amazing job with their stuff. Uh, however, you've got some other counties, some of the smaller ones in particular, where they just haven't had the, the staffing and the money yet uh, to build quite as good of a database of deeds. Now, that doesn't mean that you're out of luck, because a lot of times, in lieu of that, uh, a lot of times the staff of the clerk of court's offices, they will take a very carefully worded request. And what I mean by carefully worded is you can't just ask them, hey, uh, can you give me a list of every deed that ever existed involving somebody named McCormick? That's pretty broad. That's pretty big. They're not going to be able to do that for you. However, if you say, I have an ancestor who lived in Hamilton County sometime before the Civil War uh, named uh, John McCormick, and I'm looking for any land records that might exist in there, uh, you know, prior to the Civil War, any land transactions, or maybe just a few years after the Civil War, would you mind taking a look at that? That's going to be a lot easier because indexes to these deed records exist on paper. They're called the direct and indirect indexes. Uh, direct and indirect because the direct index is or generate, and I forget whether it's, anyway, one of those indexes covers uh, everything sorted by the grantor or the person who sells the land or gives the land away. The other is uh, sorted by grantee, the person who receives the land in some way, okay? And so because those indexes exist, uh, a lot of times these clerks of courts will be able to uh, look up uh, the deeds that you're interested in and can make certified copies for you and all that sort of thing. Uh, they usually charge a small fee for that, but it's generally not that serious. Uh, and, and you'll be able to do that even if you can't get to the records online. I do want to show you one example of what it looks like when you do actually get uh, some of those records online. And I want to show you um, Orange County because they have done just an amazing job uh, with theirs. We're, we're, I was just able to help some folks the other day with a question they had about uh, a private land transaction that took place in the 1920s uh, when some folks came down to start a farm down in Orange County. They weren't there for very long. There were no census records for these people. The only way these folks were able to prove that their family had been in Orange County at all uh, was because of land records. So um, I don't know the, exactly the address to this. In many cases, you won't. Uh, of course, every clerk of courts has their own website, their own policies, their own databases. But you generally are going to find those the same way. If I'm interested in looking for the Orange County Clerk of Courts, then I would, I would type something like this. Orange County Clerk of Courts, I want to make sure it's in Florida. Um, here we go. And so you can go right into that. Now, in some of these larger counties, like Orange County, for example, I just thought about something. In some of these larger counties, the work of the clerk of courts has actually been split up between two different folks. Sometimes you'll get uh, the office of the clerk of courts, and sometimes you'll get uh, somebody called the comptroller. Uh, who keeps track of the official records, deeds and marriage records and things like that. And that happens to actually be the case with the clerk of courts. If we were to look around on this website, we would see that, that uh, the clerk of courts for Orange County does not actually manage access to official records of deeds and marriages, that sort of thing. So what we would do instead, if, you know, let's say I don't know where those records are kept, I would say like Orange County, Florida, official deed records. Oh, okay. So it is going to be in the comptroller stuff, see? So a little Google search will generally turn this stuff right up. All right. So official records, all kinds of stuff here. Search official records. 
Now let's see. Um, I'm going to use the example of the folks who talked to me er, uh, last week asking for information about this family that they were looking for. Okay, they're going to ask you to do a little disclaimer here. That's because the records that are on here, they're making sure you know that there could be incomplete parts of the records or something, different things like that. Once again, you get a control panel that looks like this. It's got way more options than what you actually need. Try not to put more than you absolutely need in there. You might cheat yourself out of good results. Okay. Um, what we can do here, the, the family that I was looking for a couple of weeks ago was actually Zaliska, but I later found out that uh, there was a branch of the family called Serban that moved down around the same time. And let's say that I wanted to know, I want to catch uh, what they mean by either party. That means we're going to look for grantors or grantees, the people selling or the people buying. Okay. And uh, I want to find any servants who bought or sold land prior to 1930. And they may make you choose a whole date. They might not let you put a, just a year in here. So if you just put a year in and it kicks it back and says that's an invalid date, try putting in an entire month, day, year type thing just like this. And that should fix it. All right, let's, uh, let's see what we get. Servants up until 1930. Look at there. All right. And the first one, actually both of these that return, I, I knew I was going to get this, but, but both of these actually are deeds relating to where, you'll notice here, for example, that this is where John Serban, who was a, a descent, uh, an ancestor of the person who contacted me for help with this, uh, this is where John Serban was receiving land as a grantee from the Prosper Colony Company, which was a developer in Central Florida in the late teens and early 20s. They were selling land to a bunch of Michiganians, hoping that they would come down, escape the bitter cold of the winter, and start farms and make new lives for themselves. And many of them did. You can see that by looking. If you choose to look for all of the Prosper Colony records where Prosper Colony, uh, Colony Company is the grantor, you can see the whole list of people uh, that they sold land to. And you can go back and look and see where those people came from using the census. And it's amazing how many Northerners came into the area just through that one company's efforts. All right, so here's John Serban as grantee receiving the land. And then if you look here, here's John Serban and his wife Julia selling the land to a private individual just a couple of years later. All right, and you'll see over here on the right hand side that they've got an option to view image. And just like the other stuff we're looking at, here is a nice uh, image of that deed so that we can use and, and just like all the other ones it's got a nice legal description of exactly where this land is located we can use this legal description to figure out we can go walk to exactly the spot where this land was located we're going to talk about how to do that here in just a minute so that's going to be and and, and you know as we uh, as i've mentioned before Orange County's done an amazing job. Osceola County's done a good job. Leon County, you can get this kind of record with this degree of, of depth back to the 60s, 1960s. And then you've got index entries that I think go back even farther. Um, but, uh, but counties are working on this. But there, there are options if you can't get uh, to the private land records that you need from the courthouses. Let's say you've got ancestors that are all the way over in Baker County and you know, you're looking for, for evidence of land ownership in Baker County, but you don't have time to go to Baker County, that's fine. You know, have a, a chat with somebody from the clerk's office to see what they can do for you, or you can come to the state archives and look at our microfilm records of the deeds. We have the indexes to those deeds on, the, um, uh, on, on microfilm as well. So you should be able to find what you're looking for pretty quickly. All right. So keeping an eye on the time, I'm going to move on from that. Let's get back into the PowerPoint right here. Share. All right, and I noticed that we've got a couple questions in the box. So I'm going to af ask them, are these records available in all states? Chain of title is super, super important. If you've ever heard the term possession is nine tenths of the law, it's true. Okay, if there's one thing that government is going to hang on to forever and ever and ever and ever, it's when money or property has changed hands. That's something government is, if you look through our constitution, it's really seriously a lot about protecting property. Um, and so these records, yes, these records are available in all states. 
what, how exactly they're organized may differ from state to state. In the vast majority of cases, if you're looking for private land transactions, you're gonna be going to a county courthouse. In very few cases do, do I know of a, of a, a state database of, of private land transactions that you could, that you could get into. Um, but Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, those are places I've done research before. And yes, you're gonna be going to, to county courthouses to get private land transactions. State land transactions, we call our entity that holds title and grants title to, to state land, the trustees of, uh, of the Internal Improvement Fund. Every state's probably gonna have a different, um, a different name for that entity. But what you wanna ask the state archives of the state that you wanna do research in, if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for evidence of title uh, that was derived from, from a state patent, what you wanna ask that archivist is, hey archivist, how do I find out uh, whether or not or when my ancestor received title to a piece of land directly from the state, not the federal government? Make sure you put that part in there about not the federal government because it's much more common for people to ask about federal land patents. And so they're gonna try to shunt you off to the Bureau of Land Management a lot of times. But if it's state land title you're looking for, then you wanna be sure and specify that. Okay, so there's that. Interested in Washington and Indiana. Right off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure how theirs are set up, uh, but if you'll stick around, I, I tell you what, if you'll email me after this so that I can check that out for you, I can, I can help you navigate those records and, and can usually get to those sources pretty quickly. Uh, so again, give me an email. I'll make sure that that information is at the end of the program so that everybody uh, that has questions can get in touch with me on that. And how can we find out who was the builder of our home, especially if it was built in the 50s or 60s? Best resource that I can think on that is a lot of local newspapers will put new construction sections. They're usually right around the classified ads. Uh, they'll, they'll put in like, you know, here's all the building permits that were pulled uh, in the past, you know, week or two weeks or this month or whatever. And sometimes those will list the contractors in there. Um, the other place where that information is kept is on the building permits that are actually pulled by the particular city. Now, it's a crapshoot whether uh, the particular municipality or county where the pull permit was pulled, uh, whether they actually retained those permit records going back as far as you would need them. Because uh, to my knowledge, there's not a records retention schedule that says those have to be kept more than a certain amount of time. I'm not 100% certain on that. But uh, the thing to think about when you're thinking about, you know, determining a contractor, the contractor is going to be written on the building permit. So you want to go back to the permitting agency, which depending on where you live, could be the city or it could be the county. And that's where you would want to go to get that information. It's really up to the city or the county whether those records were retained. The state archives does not have a massive database of building permits for the entire state going all the way back. So, so it's, that's going to be a city or a county thing. All right, so we got that one covered. All right. Moving into, and tax sales, again, as I mentioned before, they are recorded as private land transactions, even though the county government is a facilitator in that. So you would look for tax sales, tax deeds, the same way you look for private land transactions. All right, attempts to acquire Florida land. I'm going to actually, mm, let's see, because of where we are on time, I'm gonna actually drop out of this little part right here and not, there's a, there's a couple here with Spanish land grants that I've got here. Uh, and what this is, is prior to United States ownership of Florida, um, the, you know, Spain owned Florida prior to, uh, to the United States having it. And uh, part, of the, uh, part of the deal for Spain giving Florida to the United States was that the United States promised in the adams onis Treaty uh, uh, that was finally ratified in 1821, uh, they promised to honor land titles that were granted uh, to individuals by the Spanish government. The problem is, is that it's the 1820s when this happens. Anybody can forge a document. So what had to happen was, is the United States government sent a land commission down to Florida and put out an all points bulletin to all landowners, people who said that they claimed land that had been granted to them by the Spanish. And they said, look, if you want a clean United States title to your land, 
then you need to bring all your evidence, all your surveys, your deeds, your correspondence with the Spanish government authorities, all this stuff, bring it before this commission, we'll look at it, we'll pass judgment on it, and give you a clean United States title uh, if we think that it's valid. And what we have at the State Archives, and it's actually available on floridamemory.com under the historical records section, is a complete set of all of the, uh, the Spanish land grant dossiers of material that were turned in to support the claims. We've got over a thousand of those claims documented uh, through there. Most of them are concentrated over on the Atlantic coast, uh, particularly around Amelia Island, Fernandina, St. Augustine, uh, Duval County, going all the way down uh, as far as, as Cape Canaveral and then a, even a little bit farther. They don't go terribly far inland. You don't see a whole lot of them on the western side of the St. Johns River with the exception of the Arredondo Grant around Gainesville and a few other ones in that area. Uh, but, uh, and then there's a few for the, for uh, around Pensacola. I think those Pensacola and St. Augustine were the two Spanish capitals. Uh, so that's where the majority of those grants are going to be located. Uh, but we do have those dossiers online, and so you can search by the name of the claimant uh, to find it. You can also search by geographical term. However, they were using the geographical terms of the 1820s, not modern day. Uh, so we're currently updating the database to include that, uh, but you can, you can already, right now, uh, search by uh, claimant name. So that's, that's what's going on with Spanish land grants. Again, those are on floridamemory.com under the historical records series. The Armed Occupation Act, if you have ancestors who lived in Florida around the time of the Second Seminole War, the Second Seminole War, that went from 1835 to 1842 right here in Florida, the Armed Occupation Act was an attempt by the United States government to get people to settle uh, and sort of create a human wall in between uh, the Native Americans who they had just gotten finished uh, fighting in the Second Seminole War and, and, and the white settlers who were to the north. And so what they did was they gave out a bunch of free land. All you had to do was you, you had to promise that you owned and could operate a firearm and show that you would actually cultivate a piece of land uh, that was located in the zone they wanted you to be in. And uh, what we have here is uh, a, one of those uh, Armed Occupation Act uh, applications, actually people actually applying for land. Now, if somebody received land through the Armed Occupation Act, you're going to see that title uh, come out as a federal land patent, which is what we've already looked at. The reason why the permit application files are so important is because the application files include not only the names of the people who finally did receive land, but also the people who attempted to receive land and didn't. Okay, and uh, so I'll, I'll show you real fast on this. I apologize for us going over time a little bit here, but I just want to make sure that you have everything you need. So this, you would go to the same database uh, that you would use for the, um, uh, for the state land patents here. So document search, and then the type of document that you need to be searching for here is AOP, okay? and that's Armed Occupation Act Land Permits, Applications to Settle, all right? And then same, same rule as we've been doing, I would not put anything in there besides the last name unless you've just got to. I'm gonna try, uh, let's not try Wilcox. Uh, let's, let's put in Hendry, that's a good old Florida name. Let's put in Hendry and see if we catch any Hendrys uh, who received land under this program or at least attempted to receive land under this program. All right, let's see what we get. This act was only enforced for a few years in the 1840s and 50s. So, did we get anything? Yep, there we go. We got some Henrys. We got two of them. Ooh, Robert Henry. I bet you that's Robert McPhail Henry. Are, who are you, did you want to share your screen with that or? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I have completely forgotten. To share that there we go sorry about that um i'm gonna i'm gonna run back and search real quick just to make sure you know what we're doing here so again i've clicked on armed occupation act land permits aop that's the one you want for document type and then i came over here to last name and put henry thank you shauna and i'm going to click search and i should get something back here we go so i've got two guys named henry 
two guys named, with the last name of Henry who, who applied for land uh, with the Armed Occupation Act permit. Now, if I wanted to, I could look I could look in the federal land patents, which we've looked at the database today, to look for these guys to see if they actually received this land. But with these documents, I at least know that they applied for it. And this could give me some really cool information about where they were. Even if they weren't successful, I can use these applications to figure out where they must have been living because they wanted to get land in this area. So I'm going to click on my buddy Robert Henry here because I'm really hoping it's Robert McPhail Henry from Taylor County. We'll see. All right. Robert Henry, I am the head of a family. I was born in 1843. Oh, I became a resident of Florida in 1843. It's a tract of surveyed land situated about two and a half miles. Oh, unsurveyed land uh, situated about two and a half miles from number two at the north, lying south of the state survey. Yada yada yada. What's called Long Hammock. So see, we have to, what, what happened here is that this guy applied for a piece of land that had not actually been surveyed into the public land survey system just yet, probably because of the presence of Native Americans in the area who were not particularly happy about white guys coming in and drawing lines all over their land. Um, and so this guy's actually describing the property that he wants to purchase or that he wants to receive under the act, and he's not even using uh, the, the public land survey system. This is good because there's a chance that since the land had not been put into uh, into the PLSS just yet, that they might have denied this claim. They might have said, well, you can have some, but you got to pick someplace different. But this might actually give us some insight into where Robert Hendry was trying to settle, even if it wasn't where he eventually ended up. So some cool details could come out of a document like this. All right, so let me jump back into the PowerPoint. All right, new share. Here we go. All right, so, and then the, oh, man, there's just so much. All right, uh, and last but not least on the, on the kinds of things here uh, is the Florida homestead applications. Just like the federal government had a homestead program, so did the, uh, so did the state government. Uh, and, and so rather than the land for homesteads from the state coming from the state's pool of land that they had been given by Congress, uh, well, that's, that's, where, that's where the land for this program would have been coming from instead of coming directly from the federal government. Sorry, that was, that was probably gobbledygook there. And you can see that it's essentially what's happening here is somebody saying, hey, I've, you know, I've, I've, I would like to apply to you know, to enter all this information, you know, this is the, the piece of land that I would like to have. And, you know, I have now fulfilled all of the obligations uh, to get a piece of homestead, you know, land based on the, the rules set out by the state uh, for a homestead act. Will you please grant me title to this piece of land? Same thing uh, with, with, with the Armed Occupation Act permits. The reason why they're so good and why they can be such a smoking gun uh, for trying to find an ancestor is that uh, these homestead applications, not everybody who applied actually got the land. So if you've got an ancestor who applied for a homestead but didn't get one, you can catch them in this set of records, but you won't catch them in the deeds uh, where, where land was actually granted out because they were denied. So this is an amazing source. And what you do for this to find people, uh, to find people in this is you want to look at series S1051 in the catalog for the State Archives of Florida. I'm going to show you really fast how to get into those. All right, then this will probably have to be our last little bit for now. Let's see if I can, okay, that's what I want. All right, so now you should be looking at my web browser. The Archives Online Catalog is at archivescatalog.info.florida.gov. Archives Catalog dot info dot florida dot gov. All right, and I'm going to show you a shortcut. All right, so anytime that you're looking for a specific series of records in the State Archives of Florida, and many times that's, you know exactly what series you're looking for because you found it in a citation or a presentation like this one or something like that. I'm going to show you how to get to that specific series. If you use quotation marks and type S space and then the number of the series that you want. 
Usually that's going to be an S, sometimes it'll be an L, sometimes an M, uh, but you'll see that in the citation that you're using. In this case, we're looking at series S1051. Make sure that you're searching at the series slash collection level. That means you're not looking at folders within the collection, you're looking at the collection level. You'll click search. The one that you asked for will be the one that pops up, okay? If I click on the little number here, it's going to tell me a little bit about the Homestead application files and what all's in those records. But if I click on this little yellow icon over here, it's going to take me to a folder tree showing me all of the records that are inside of that collection. And you can see here that it's divided up into boxes and then folders within those boxes. Here's the aggravating part. These applications are put in numerical order, not in alphabetical order. Why they did this, couldn't tell you. But there's a way that you can search through these really quickly. What I would advise you to do is to trick the system a little bit, because usually it's only going to show you about 30 lines at a time, which is what it's doing right now. But if you'll go up here to your address bar and see where it says record max 30, what that is, is that's instructions to the server saying, show me 30 results at a time so that it doesn't take too long to load the page. You can actually get as many as 999 at one time. So if I change this to say record max 999 and hit enter, it's going to take a little longer to load the page, but now I get a thousand of these to search at one time. What I can do at this point is I can use my browser's built-in search function, which can usually be activated by, if you're on a Mac, holding down Command and hitting F, or if you're on a PC, I can hold down Control and hit F, and it's gonna toggle the natural in, in onboard uh, search engine uh, for my, my web browser here, and I can search for the name that I wanna find, okay? Let's say, for example, that I was looking for a guy named Brown, with the last name of Brown. <laughs> All right, I have found in Google Chrome here, I have found nine different people named Brown on this page here. Here's Alexander Brown, here's James W. Brown. Let's see, we've got J.C. Brown, L.C. Brown, William Brown, William C. Brown, Daniel, and on and on and on. Oop, we even got some people named Brown Inc. You know, so that's a way that you can get through this. Now, there is a secondary way to uh, search through these. Let's say that I wanted to find that same Browning guy that I was just looking at. I can type Browning in here. And I can type and I can say, well, I want to look at the container file unit because that's the next level down below collection. You got collections and then you got containers and file units within the collections. It's organized a little differently than a library. Archives use a very hierarchical system. All right, I can click on that and I can click search. Now, if you've got a really common name like Williams or something like that, there's likely to be a massive amount of results that don't actually relate to this because you're looking for any folder in the entire archives that involves somebody named Browning. Now, see like for example, these two first uh, search results, those are not from our collection. That's M9021 in 2009, not really what we need. But what we get right here is we see Noah Browning, this is that same guy that I was looking at on the other search, and he is actually uh, going to be the person. Now, here's the thing about the Homestead application files. Just by clicking on these, you're not going to actually get the image. Uh, the image, you're not actually going to get it. You're just going to get a listing. But if you will call the State Archives Reference Desk, which I have their information here at the end of the program, um, and give them this information. Say, I'm looking for something in record group 598, series number 1051, homestead application files, container 8, file unit 8.121, and I want a copy of whatever's in that folder, they can get it for you, and they can send it to you by email. You don't have to come into the archives to do that kind of an inquiry, all right? I know that was kind of rushed, but that's, uh, that's going to get us that. So, at this point in the presentation, because we've used up a good bit of time on this stuff, I don't think I've got the time to actually show you how to locate land in real space. I think we may need to do a part two to this. Shauna, Nellie, what do you think? Can we do a part two on this to get the second half? Hey, as long as we've got interest, we are more than happy to host you. And, you know, it's as long as you're willing to come and talk with us. I'm sure that, that we can set something up for that. Yeah, okay. definitely.
then guys, I'm going to make this deal with you. Since I took so long to show you all the different kinds of records, what I'm going to do is Nellie and Shauna and I will get together and we will come up with a part two to this. And what part two will be, it'll be a little shorter because we'll only have that one skill set that we need to cover, is I will show you how to take the public land survey system and actually use that system to locate exactly in real space where your ancestors' land was located. Because once you've got one of those deeds or those land patents, you have everything you need on those deeds and land patents to show you exactly where land is in real space, not only for the 1830s or 40s, wherever it was when they bought the stuff, we are still using that same system today. So you can figure out what's there now. You can get directions to go and walk on it yourself. Always give permission before going on private property. But uh, anyway, there's a lot you can do with that. So let's do that in a part two, because I know we got some folks who are ready to eat dinner. So let's uh, let's do that, and I'll uh, I'll take any final questions that you have, and I'm going to put my contact information up here on the screen, so that oh, did I not do that? Oh well, that's uh, what I will do then. Is I'm going to put that information like this. All right. Then you'll need to, sh to share the screen again. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Let me yeah. let me share the screen here. All right, and I'm going to put in my contact info right here. My email address is joshua.goodman at dos.myflorida.com. And I would give you my phone number, but the thing is, is that we are all, most of us at the archives, working from home most of the time right now. So my desk line is actually going to take you straight to voicemail. So email is the best, uh, the best way. Now you can also, if you if you have a question that's about the collection in general and not something that you specifically want to ask me, I'm always glad to take your questions. But you can also contact the reference desk directly at archives at dos.myflorida.com. You can also contact them by phone because their phones in the building are being forwarded to members of the reference desk staff at their homes. And so you'll be able to get access to those folks uh, even, even with us being out of the office. And their number is 850-245-6719. Okay. And so that's your, that's, uh, that's the Part one uh, of, of using land documents uh, to find your ancestors. Uh, let's see. I have some other questions here that I'd like to get before we leave. Angela, can you find information about a house that was moved from one location to another within the same town? Okay. That, again, there's a, there's a couple of ways that that can be documented. Number one, you generally have to pull a permit of some sort to do that. So whatever permitting agency in a county or a city would have been responsible for filling out that permit, check with that entity to see if they have records going back that far. It's a complete crapshoot whether they have them going back 50, you know, 50, 60 years, whenever the move took place. If it's only like 10 years ago, you got a much better chance of finding that. But I, I imagine you're looking for something that's a little older. I would check with whichever, whichever, whatever county or municipality that move took place in, I would find the permitting agency. The other thing is that when houses get moved, it looks kind of funny, and so it usually ends up in the local newspaper. I would find a database of that, that covers the local newspaper, whatever the nearest newspaper is for that area, newspapers.com, newspaperarchives.com, the University of Florida's Digital Newspaper Project for Florida. All of those might be potential sources to find uh, records documenting the movement of that house. And the other question that we have here is, can you share a website that we can go to to find the public land survey system? I actually have a pre-taped version of a very similar, uh, a very similar uh, explanation to what I was planning to give this evening. If you look on YouTube.com, okay, so if you go on YouTube.com, and the reason I'm sending you to my own stuff, it's not just to toot my own horn or the archives horn, it's just that uh, a lot of explanations of the public land survey system are built for people who work with land regularly. And uh, I do it in sort of a step-by-step -step method for genealogists. And, and I, I know that I'm going to give you the information that you need uh, in there. So if you'll go to YouTube.com and search for the Florida Bureau of Library Development. 
Okay, that is the entity in my department that does all of our webinars and stuff. And we've done a program called Using Land for Family History Research or something like that. If you look under Florida Bureau of Library Development, we have a genealogy playlist on our YouTube channel for the Bureau of Library Development, and it will have a guide in there to using land for public land uh, uh, for uh, for family history research and. Um, you can fast forward, so you don't have to listen to all this stuff about federal and state land patents and private deeds and all that kind of thing. You can skip straight to the part where we start talking about the public land survey system. But I still uh, will be glad to do a tutorial on that part in a second uh, in a second program. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think we're good. I think we're good. Uh, yep. Nellie, you want to close out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So so yeah. That was really interesting. That was super cool. And uh, let's see. Yeah. Thanks so much for um, for um, for letting us know about this. By the way, um, there. Yeah. I was gonna just mention that their YouTube channel had that the YouTube channel for Florida Memory has some great uh, resources instead. Just to, uh, my colleagues at Leon, the Leroy Collins Leon County Library are putting out tons of great digital programming in the coming days. More details are available on the virtual events calendar through leoncountyfl.gov slash library. But you can get digital story time, sing along, baby time at 10.30 at, uh, a.m. Monday through Friday. There's a family time on Saturday. Uh, summer youth programs are on, they have on Mondays at 6.30. Uh, they have, the, there's the teen hangouts on Thursdays at 3. They're going to be making slime next time. Uh, next week, this Thursday, this Thursday, they're going to do amateur sleuths for the adult uh, mystery book club, and Annie Get Your Glue Gun is going to have their meeting on Saturday at one, and then the young we're adult. Doing a, um, we're doing a at home care, uh, uh, so there'll be some um, DIY hair conditioners and some like relaxation treatments this weekend. Uh, that'll be that this week's Annie Get Your Glue Gun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That, that is very good to know. <laughs> and um, the Young at Heart, the Young Adult at Heart Book Club is on Sunday at three o'clock. And we and, are reading Miss Peregrine's uh, Home for Peculiar oh. Children. Sorry, I'm hosting that, so I'm just yeah, yeah. On the bandwagon. <laughs> Sorry about that, Nellie. No, very good, very good. Good to, good information straight from the source. Excellent. Um, and just, just to let you know, the library is open to the public with restrictions. Main library is open Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Sunday, 1 to 6 p.m. All the branches are open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And um, we are, there are online resources that are available from your home. Like for genealogists especially, there's Ancestry Library, which is definitely going to be available through July, to the end of July, to July 31st. And there's a whole list of resources available on our website, you know, through leoncountyfl.gov. Uh, we've got, the library has a Facebook account, library has, their, has Instagram, we've got YouTube with webinar recordings on it. If you want to reach us by phone, you can call 850-606-2665. Or if you want e email reference help, you can do answer squad, A-N-S-W-E-R-S-Q-U-A-D, at leoncountyfl.gov. And yeah, just thanks so much for stay for for coming in and staying with us for this for this uh, for this thing. We think as a, it was been I th I thought it was really interesting. Um, and through the Leon County uh, uh, Lori Collins Leon County Library virtual programming, and we hope everyone stays safe. Yes, have a lovely evening. Thank you for coming. All right. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye.